Good afternoon to you, Mark South of HurricaneTrack.com. It is June 1st, 2022, and that means it's the official start of the Atlantic hurricane season, and this is my first hurricane outlook and discussion for the season, uh, officially, for the hurricane season. We've been doing these the last few weeks because things have been kind of busy, but officially, this is the first one, and it's going to be kind of lengthy today because we had a lot to go over, a few things I want to introduce you to, especially if you are new to watching my work. But as we get into the season, uh, I want to try to keep these shorter, maybe around 10 minutes or so. And you know, when we get something, though, that really needs attention, we'll focus as much time as we need on it because my goal is to keep you educated and keep you safe. All right, We want to mitigate damage, if at all possible, but the number one goal is to keep you alive. You know, selfish purposes, right? Got to have you on that side of the screen alive and well because otherwise there's no reason for me to be here. So just look at it that way. Mark's being selfish and trying to keep me safe. You're darn right I want to keep you safe because I've got almost 30 years of experience dealing with hurricanes, studying them, studying their impacts, pioneered a tremendous set of technology to get closer to hurricane impacts, especially storm surge, than probably anybody else in the world. And I'm not trying to, you know, boost uh, my ego or brag. It's true. Just look at the YouTube. Look at the results of our work. It's, you know, I might be the face of this, but we have a great team and uh, we're going to be ready for this season. So welcome to the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. Welcome to Hurricane Track on YouTube and across our other social media. We'll take a look at that as I wrap things up. All right, let's get on with it. National Hurricane Center will always be our go-to source of information. And that being said, here are our two areas, 91L and just a disturbance, disturbance one, disturbance two. And we have a high chance of this becoming a tropical depression uh, as it moves from the Northwest Caribbean Sea here, eventually towards South Florida, Western Cuba could get in on that. Maybe the Northwest Bahamas will talk impacts in just a moment. Real quick, I'll try to keep this as fast as possible today. But again, there is a lot to go over, so bear with me. This is the first one of the year officially. Um, a 91 L, what does that mean? Well, 91 is part of this numbering system, 90 through 99, that the National Hurricane Center uses to designate a suspect area um, more than just calling it Disturbance 1 or Disturbance 2. It's actually AL for Atlantic, and then 90, 91, 92, all the way up to 99, and then they start over. I don't know who came up with it. I don't know why they use the numbers, you know, the 90s, uh, but they do. And that way, if there's a bunch of activity out there, we can keep up with what's what, and it gives us a way to track them. Computer models get assigned, recon gets tasked, and it's just a great classification system before something becomes a depression or a named storm. Now, speaking of named storms, I want to just make sure that we know what the names are for this year. We're going to start off with Alex. And maybe if everything is really, really busy, like they say it could be, they being various universities, the uh, NOAA folks, Colorado State, uh, some private weather companies, and many people in between, the general consensus is we're going to use a lot of these names here. Alex, Bonnie, Colin, Danielle, Earl, Fiona, Gaston, Hermine, Ian, Julia, Carl, Lisa, Martin, Nicole, Owen, Paula, Richard, Sherry, Tobias, Virginie, no A, it's not Virginia, and no, that is not a typo, Virginie, and Walter. Will we use all 21 names? Possibly. And then what happens after that? We have an auxiliary list. No more Greek alphabet. We have an auxiliary list, and it begins with Adria, and then it goes to Braylon, and that's pretty much all I remember off the top of my head. Uh, if we get to that, we've had a very busy season, so let's just, let's just not, all right? All right, so satellite imagery. This is from Tropical Tidbits. We will cite this wonderful website often and give credit where credit is due. Dr. Levi Cowan, you know his work. You probably know this site. It's extremely popular, but that'll be uh, a good source of information. That and weathernerds.org. Don't have any of their products up today, but we will use Weather Nerds as well and a few other sites. Nevertheless, this is our disturbance down here. Um, strong upper level winds, you can just see the satellite imagery showing that. Not very well organized and not rapidly developing. Something that we typically would expect for this time of year. It's early in the season. There are a few ingredients in place, but not all of them. 
and some of them are a little bit, you know, disheveled ingredients. Not not everything is falling into perfect slots yet. All right, so it's not going to have a chance to develop into a hurricane. Hurricane is your news making big headline. It gets the views on social media, lots of headlines, lots of graphics. But hurricane is just a term that we give to a weather system when it reaches a certain threshold. You need to be looking at this in terms of impacts. And just looking at this large area of deep thunderstorm activity, or what we call convection, that equals impacts, okay? Rain, squally weather, you know, ruining plans if you're on a cruise or something. All kinds of impacts come from these systems. It's not just about the name-grabbing word hurricane. So looking at the larger, or I'm sorry, the smaller picture, this is the Yucatan. We're zooming in here. Uh, Yucatan Peninsula, the Gulf of Honduras, limited deep convection overall, upper level winds not ideal, maybe some dry air, um, but it is sitting, the disturbance is sitting over very warm water, relatively speaking, that water is going to get warmer throughout the season, and we can see, and this is a great product, uh, the vorticity of it, sort of what is the health of it like, and that shows up really nicely here in the vorticity graphic, however, we have two competing areas, there's one and here's number two. And they're kind of pivoting around each other or playing a little bit of tug of war for the available energy. There's only so much energy available in the weather patterns of the United, of the United States, of the globe, everywhere, not just U.S. centric. Uh, the global heat budget, you know, all of that, you can't, that's why we don't have hurricanes just roaming the earth. There's only so much energy to go around. So those two competing areas of concentrated spin, energy, vorticity, um, means that this is going to struggle to develop. If there was just one singular area, like we might see from a tropical wave eventually that comes off Africa out here, and it gets going somewhere in the main development region, August and beyond, hopefully it waits till that long, um, that's different because then it's got everything to itself and those systems can uh, develop much quicker. This one seems to be competing with uh, the overall energy environment down here, but this should dominate and eventually kind of pivot around and then head towards Florida uh, in some form or fashion. So this too, this, this, just looking at these colors here, that's energy, that's weather, that has impacts. So don't think, well, it's not a hurricane, I don't care. You need to care because, well, we'll talk about impacts in just a moment. It'll all make sense. So water temperatures in and around the area are plenty warm except just to the north of the Yucatan due to upwelling, strong southerly winds generally push the water away and then colder, deeper water comes up to replace that. We call that upwelling. Uh, but other than that, you got the loop current sitting up in here and then the shelf water near Florida, the Florida Straits is uh, all very warm, 82 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, um, about 28 Celsius. So that's not an inhibiting factor at all. Meanwhile, off the uh, East Coast, Mid-Atlantic region, water temperatures gradually warming up, almost 80 degrees here from Myrtle Beach up towards the Outer Banks of North Carolina, in the Gulf Stream already at 80 degrees or 26 Celsius, and these will just continue to warm up these uh, sea surface temperatures. Now the anomalies, the departures, we're going to talk about this often, and I've talked about this in my off-season updates a lot. If you're new to my YouTube channel or just found me on social media as a whole, go back through YouTube and look. If you got time, you want to binge watch some old updates and look what we've been doing. We've been tracking this particular graphic for months and months and months, actually years. But for this year, we've been seeing a steady decrease in the sea surface temperatures here, anomalous cooling against the average, it's cooler, and then a much warmer Atlantic overall. And you see this blue area, you go, well, what about that? That's actually not a good sign when you have the subtropics up here, the North Atlantic colder, and the warm anomalies are to the south where they should be. That means you focus the upward motion, the energy through here. This is not ideal, like a 2005, 2010 type of look where it's just going to go gangbusters, but we're close. We're close. We could, those anomalies, the departures from the average are substantial enough that if that were to continue, we don't see anything that comes along that disrupts this and cools those temperatures, especially south of 20 degrees north latitude here. 
this rectangle, the main development region, if that stays warmer than average, it is going to be a very long and very impactful hurricane season, uh, I do believe. Not a guarantee. Nothing in weather is a guarantee until it's happening. But that's the setup. All right, so what's happening? Um, it was uh, Depression Agatha, all right? And it's not an invest in the system for tracking just yet. Um, we go back to the site here. The uh, This is from the NCAR, the Tropical Cyclone Guidance. It hasn't popped up yet, but it is invest 91L. But I don't think they're doing much in the way of modeling on it just yet. No H wharf. Um, but that's what this will look like. I just want to show you this. This is when it was uh, an Eastern Pacific system. And, you know, this is a couple of days ago or yesterday morning. <laughs> Seems like a couple of yes uh, days ago. The guidance generally suggesting a track towards Florida. We will look at this often throughout the season from this particular website here. Again, out from um, the NCAR, National Centers for Atmospheric Research, I do believe. Really, really nice uh, web page of all kinds of different tools to track tropical cyclones. Another good tool would be our global models. And you're going to hear me use these a lot. Mainly the GFS, that's the Global Forecast System, the U.S. main weather prediction model, the biggest one. It's got its operational and then a bunch of support on, uh, models that we call ensemble members, the what-ifs. The same model run with different parameters that give you different outcomes. That's the ensembles. The European model also does the same thing, the ECMWF, or what we call the Euro uh, for short. That is the same setup. Uh, it's got much, many, much more ensembles. I think it's like 50 or 51 total members, something like that. The GFS, I think, is around 20. Got to look into that. It might have changed. But nevertheless, we're going to usually look at the operational from both, and then occasionally what the ensembles show. It starts to get confusing, and we don't want to confuse you. You just want to know where the hurricane or weather system is going to go, and what do I need to do about it? So that's what we want to really try to focus on this year. So starting off, this is that same level of the atmosphere that I was showing you earlier, the vorticity, right? This is the 12Z run, so it's coming out now. 12Z meaning it initialized at 12 Zulu time, which is 8 a.m. Eastern time, just to give you some perspective. This is the first disturbance that the Hurricane Center, well, the second one, sorry. So this is number two. See, this is why we label them. And this is 91L down here. So we'll just put a 91 right there. And look at the two competing areas, the GFS seeing that. That didn't show up very well. Let's use blue. There's the first competing area of vorticity, and there is the second one. This is the model seeing, quote, unquote, exactly what this sees, which is an analysis. This is not a model of something in the future. So the GFS has a good handle seeing that. You understand? So let's move this out into time and see what happens over the next several days. Um, so this is tomorrow morning, uh, Thursday morning. Again, two competing systems down there. You can clearly see that. We go backwards, forwards. And they're kind of rotating around this common center here. One competing center, the other competing center. Large mess of rain and just inclement weather. Not bundling and coming together too quickly. So going out into time, tomorrow afternoon. This is Thursday afternoon. Still not really coming together in rapid fashion, which is good, obviously. But nevertheless, as we approach Friday, that whole mess there starts to get closer to southwest Florida with some... Uh, of a vigorous look to a little bit more impacts, possibly locally enhanced winds, especially down in the Keys, heavy rain down here, the threat of severe weather, water spouts. In other words, not a hurricane, but also not nothing. Oh, that's nothing. You have millions of people that live down there, people going down for vacation already, um, I-75, I-95, Alligator Alley, you name it, 41, Naples over to Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, the Keys, US-1 down there. Just imagine you got a ton of rain. That is impacts. That's what that is. You know, so don't write it off. People are hyping it up, whatever. No, they aren't. Well, some might, but we're just showing you, I'm showing you the reality here, and that is that is a lot of rain and just general inclement weather is possibly headed towards South Florida. Then it goes across, gets into the Southwest Atlantic, maybe develops further. You know, it might become a name storm somewhere in here. Intensity guidance is not perfect by far. So we don't know for sure. 
but it doesn't look ideal, and that's the good news. So we're not looking at a hurricane threat down here. And generally, the European is the same. Uh, this is from the 6Z run, so it's a little earlier uh, back in time. The 12Z doesn't come out until later. But there's the two competing centers that the GFS also shows. So at least they're singing the same tune, if that makes sense. Moving this out into time, also just a large area of energy, showers, thunderstorms, squally weather, heads to and across Florida. So look at that. This right here should just say all of this area down here, the Florida Straits, parts of the Northwest Bahamas eventually, Western Cuba, squally, rainy, very heavy rain at times, flooding rain, and that could be a real big problem. And that is represented very nicely in the five-day um, quantitative precipitation forecast, or QPF, I'm trying to circle it, we'll just highlight it. QPF, quantitative precipitation, this isn't verbatim, but it is a good guidance. You understand? Look at all that. The red's down to the almost gold color, four, five, six, seven, ten inches of rain possible in a major population area. Yes, that could be problematic. So that's what you need to be thinking of. Rain, not for, more than likely, North Florida and the Panhandle. No issues there. There will also be onshore flow somewhere down here, and that could pile up the water. So some marine impacts as well down at the waterfront. And if it's happening over the weekend, a lot of people trying to hit the beach, that could be a big problem. The other tool we're going to use this year quite often, especially near landfalls, is this real-time radar page and site from Mark Nissenbaum from Florida State University, a wonderful set of radar regions and different radar sites from the WFOs, that's weather forecast offices. You have a national picture and then just different areas that he, Mark Nissenbaum, uh, selects. For example, this is one down here in Florida, and we could load up a, a nice long uh, loop if we wanted to. I mean, it goes all the way to 200 frames, for goodness sakes. So tomorrow, I'll show you this, uh, probably. And then again, certainly on uh, Friday, as this gets closer. But this is a great site. We will reference this a lot. All right, leaving the tropics just for a minute. And well, until tomorrow, anyway, we're done with the tropics. Uh, I do track and keep up with severe weather. I'm a weather geek at heart. It's interesting to me. We have some technology that we can use for blizzards, uh, lake effect snow events, the desert monsoon, and Great Plains type severe weather. You know, whatever that means out here, Tornado Alley. Not necessarily storm chasing and looking for tornadoes rather than just telling the story. Taking our followers with us, we set up some of our equipment. We can be in many places at once just like we do for hurricanes. And I do enjoy tracking severe weather. It's a lot more challenging because the storms are farther apart, they're difficult, the terrain, you know, bandwidth, it, it becomes very challenging. So there's an educational side too. I want to keep you in the loop as to what and where and when. This is today's outlook. Huge area of a slight risk, so just keep that in mind. At least the tornado threat is generally low. 2% in the green area is the wind threat, highest in West Texas, and then the hail threat also highest in West Texas, could get some pretty deep thunderstorms here, deep meaning that they are very tall in the atmosphere, so the hail threat is going to be highest way over there in West Texas. That's today. This goes out through several days. Tomorrow the, the focus shifts back to the east a little bit with the mid-Atlantic states, the Delmarva region, uh, with the slight risk. And then finally, days uh, day three, southeast U.S., and then again back in parts of uh, just near the Front Range and maybe just east of there to eastern New Mexico and northwest Texas Panhandle. You know, it's still severe weather season. Interesting note about this. We have not seen, and this is a good thing, these really big outbreaks of multiple days of long-track violent tornadoes. We've had a few, don't get me wrong, but it seems like that's getting to be less and less in Tornado Alley, the traditional area, and starting to shift over the years more towards uh, the deep south down here. And I think you know that. It's not like, oh, wow, Mark finally figured that out. We've seen that, but it's really starting to become more prevalent. I know a few of the uh, more seasoned, true-hearted storm chasers that really focus on the plains, and uh, they've kind of noticed the same thing, that we're less and less of these big high-risk days out here with lots of long-track, big-time tornadoes, and we're starting to see more of that happening over here for some reason. So... You know, we'll see. Maybe the, uh, an eventual El Nino 
could change that. Uh, I have been out here all throughout this area over the last several days. What have I been doing? Well, this is just one example. I could do a whole update on just that. Uh, we set up these remote cams just like we do for hurricanes. This is one that we had um, just northeast of Thomas, Oklahoma. And look at that big thunderstorm complex. You also see the cows out there in the field. And uh, they know the severe weather's coming. They're moving around. They can anticipate it. And then they all head somewhere out of the shop. Maybe there's a barn over there somewhere. Or as Jesse Pinkman calls it, a cow house. A Breaking Bad reference. But then look, the, uh, the storms come in. And uh, really heavy rain. There's even some hail in there. The field gets flooded. And bam, you know, it's, uh, there's impacts. So this is neat. It's pretty cool. We can be in multiple places at once uh, with our cameras, just like we do during hurricanes. We also do this in winter storms, lake effect snows. Uh, but hurricanes, of course, are the big draw. That's what we're, it's why I'm hurricane track. But we do cover other weather. So just letting you know that. It's, you know, the awareness side, telling the stories about it all. I enjoy it very much. So hurricanetrack.com, that's the website been around since 1999. I will post updates in the blog area from time to time. But with social media, it's so much easier, and I can reach a lot of people through Twitter, um, YouTube post, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Yes, I'm on TikTok. I'll show you that graphic in a minute. But the site is hurricanetrack.com. Um, during field missions, when we're active for hurricanes, this will basically be static, and there's going to be a big embedded YouTube player like we have on here now for uh, our series, the Hurricane Highway is an example. Um, and it'll be a live feed from our vehicle right on the home page. And that gets managed by our back end crew. Uh, and this just becomes our portal for live coverage. So bookmark the site, hurricanetrack.com. And when we're live during the hurricane season, ah, I'm telling you, if you haven't seen it, you are in for an amazing experience for our capabilities, our equipment, the weather data we provide. And, of course, we are crowdfunded through Patreon, a wonderful platform that allows you to support our efforts. And, I mean, it's just tremendous. Anywhere from $4, $10, whatever the case is that fits your budget. Our prices haven't gone up, by the way. Our cost of uh, access uh, didn't change. There's no inflation over at Hurricane Track. Uh, we've kept it at $10 for the access to pretty much everything we have. Uh, 25 hasn't changed. We've actually added features without increasing the cost. So our costs have gone up, but so has the support, and that is a wonderful thing. I do appreciate it. We are over 650 strong right now and would like to grow it. Our target is about 3,000 annual uh, patrons or supporters to have a big community but not too big. I like knowing people on a first-name basis when I can, interacting with people. We do these Zoom meetings for the $25 level and up. And even when we get a big hurricane coming in, it's really important we include all of the tiers. I don't want to be exclusionary. That's not the point. I'm not trying to sell you something. We're trying to develop this community of weather-related material, ideas, equipment people fund, you name it. That's how we do it. It costs a lot of money to do this. And we fund it through Patreon. And in return, you are part of something very special. So check it out, patreon.com slash hurricane track. You can look at it right through the home page. Click on the HT Insider or down here where it says sign up today. Finally, yes, uh, we're on pretty much, I guess, everything. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, yes, TikTok, I'm still learning it, and Instagram. Uh, we have a great crew of people that volunteer behind the scenes that help to do our graphics, that help with social media management. You'll get to know some of those people one way or the other throughout the rest of the hurricane season ahead. All right, so again, my number one goal is to keep you alive during in uh, high-impact weather events, hurricanes being sort of the Super Bowl of those events. I think we can all agree with that. Secondary is education. Got to keep you alive, then I got to keep you educated. If we can do that, I think we can have a safer and more educated uh, path through the hurricane season. So glad to have you. I do appreciate it. My contact info was on that other page. If you need to reach me, I'm a, a, I typically try to respond. Yeah, I don't have millions of subscribers on YouTube, and that's a good thing in one regard because I'm not so big and popular that I can't interact with the people who make this possible, and that's very important to me. It really is. You know, we might get bigger 
by 50, 75 percent one day, 100, 200,000 subscribers, 3,000 on Patreon, that would be great. But I really like where we are. I appreciate you helping to get here, and I look forward to doing these videos and more uh, throughout the rest of the season. Before I let you go, speaking of videos, this was long today, yes, but every morning from now until the end of November, I will be producing a very short two minutes or less uh, What's Up in the Tropics. That's what we call it. Nice, cute little name. And that's going to go on all those social media platforms, and that will set the tone for the day ahead and what I'm looking at. It's called What's Up in the Tropics. Find it out there. It's on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. It's on TikTok, you know, whatever your favorite is. And it will even be on Spotify through Anchor. And you might even should be able to subscribe to it as a podcast, I do believe. So that's every morning, uh, usually between 8 and 9 a.m., and then we do this longer, hopefully 10 minutes or less in the future, Hurricane Outlook and discussion in the afternoon. All right? All right. That is it for me for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. Great to be here and have you uh, watching. So stay safe this season, and I'll do my, my best to help you do that. I am Mark Suttoth for Hurricane Track. I'll talk to you again tomorrow morning.